So um, I have some slides, but I haven't really got a talk prepared. So if anybody has any questions or they want to um, start a discussion. So part of this is me asking you questions, because I've, I've got a job to do, but I don't know how to do it. And it follows on from a lot of the, the talks we've heard earlier. So hopefully you can see some uh, continuity in, in that. So um, yeah, I'm the managing editor of this uh, forthcoming open access journal called Crypto Economic Systems. It's uh, going to be published by MIT Press. Uh, part of the um, MIT Media Lab called the Digital Currency Initiative has initiated it. And uh, as, you can, as you'll see later, it's kind of part of what's initiated to be a broad multi-institute effort to try and do some rigorous interdisciplinary peer-reviewed research, have a, a venue for that, uh, very specifically within this kind of intersection of fields. Now, Zarko has done a really great job of talking about how uh, interdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity can actually kind of be mapped out and visualized. And so um, uh, one of the things that uh, uh, our group has done historically is look uh, not just at interdisciplinarity, but also what you might call anti-disciplinarity. So if you remember Zargon's kind of network node map, the, 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 like if you interpolate between the centers, you might get something that you might call interdisciplinary. But if you look for the voids in between these disciplines, then you might get something that's anti-disciplinary. Okay, with that uh, in mind, let's uh, jump in. Okay, hopefully this will be smooth enough. Yes, so I just want to draw your attention to a website, which is cryptoeconomic.systems. Uh, up there, there's some information about our March 2020 conference. Um, we've got a call for papers open at the moment, uh, which will close on the 19th of November. And so that's the first intake of papers that are going to go through our kind of, uh, we'll, we'll discuss the review process in a little bit. It's going to go through our peer review process, um, then accepted papers will get published, uh, presented at the March conference, and then published in a proceedings in the first issue of the journal, which will be uh, sometime next year. All right, so uh, here's a brief outline of the talk. I'm just gonna uh, skip over the, um, the, the background, because I think uh, quite a few people in this audience are probably already familiar with things like why scholarly publishing has lots of problems and so on. So, uh, yes, I'm from MIT. This, this is uh, yeah, the place where I actually work. That's my friend Theo who took that picture in Tanzania. So, yes. Don't believe everything that people tell you, especially in speaker biographies on, on, the, on conferences. Okay, so, uh, what's the problem? The problem is human communication is hard. So we're at a conference. What happens at a conference? Somebody at the front. Um, has neural impulses, they look at you, they make small mouth noises, you hear small mouth noises, you have to decode those within the uh, context within which they're said, within the languages. So we're in, a, we're in Germany, but I'm speaking English. Probably the majority of people here aren't native English speakers. We're also talking about interdisciplinary, kind of weird, nuanced technology topics. So this is hard. Even at the best of times, communication is hard. So that's the kind of um, the, the framing which I'd like to start from. And you know, when things are hard to understand, like Zygum does this a, a lot as well, um, it's sometimes, you know, we're pattern recognizing creatures, so we like to find ways that we can reduce bits of information down. We can um, use conceptual models like uh, you know, uh, network graphs, or we can use uh, models like uh, stacks of layers to try and engage in some differential discretization, to try and understand the similarities and differences between things, or to try to define uh, terms. So here, here at a conference called Blockchain for Science, if I was to randomly poll 10 people in the audience and ask for your 10-word definition of a blockchain, I would probably get at least five or six different answers. So, um, yeah, then come back to these topics that we uh, often uh, hear in the credo of blockchain, decentralization, trust minimization, censorship resistance, permissionlessness. Now, my opinion is helpful to have these kinds of conceptual lenses so you can define things at a particular layer. So you might want to say, um, permissionlessness is largely a social layer phenomenon where no subset of uh, participants of the network are prevented from entering transactions into the record. Or you might say that sensitive resistance is primarily a protocol layer phenomenon where no type of transaction is prevented from uh, entering the network with a ledger. Anyway, you can take this kind of reducto ad absurdum to this thing that I call the ontological meta stack, where you kind of um, might see how uh, different um, disciplines are related and how they link together or how the um, interplay between subjectivity and objectivity, between precision and uh, uh, holistic uh, vision vary. Okay, so state of things today. There's a really cool article that came out last year, which I guess some of you might have seen called, uh, this year even, uh, 10 Hot Topics Around Scholarly Publishing. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. I can't remember what journal it's in. It might even be called Publications, actually, the uh, open access journal. And so this is um, going over some of the pain points in scholarly publishing. So let's just uh, recap. Uh, 350 years ago, uh, the Royal Society in England started a journal called um, Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. And that was pretty much the first real kind of rigorous 
a scholarly journal, you could say. And then, you know, from there, people started to develop uh, uh, methods to vet and verify the research, things like peer review. Now, if you go back and look at the history of peer review, it's pretty interesting, because you had for actually quite a long period of time, uh, George Gabriel Stokes, who was the secretary of the Royal Society, he was the single peer reviewer for everything that came in to the Royal Society on every topic. So this is actually coming back to that metastack thing, kind of, people were still natural philosophers, and we were looking, spanning across disciplines. And as time's gone on, um, the proliferation of journals has been driven by, like, the explosion of, of scholarly guilds and societies, and also by uh, commercial publishers. And we now have this situation where we have, like, you know, untold, countless numbers of, of journals um, with all kinds of different um, publishing models, scholarly models, uh, rights, um, relationships with, uh, with authors, and, and, and so on. So you could say that um, we had a question about preprints earlier. So this is an interesting one where people are uh, divided over whether we should be uh, putting work uh, in an interim state or an unreviewed state in staging servers like preprint servers, archive and ePrint, or whether that invalidates the novelty of the research. That so in fact, it's already been kind of published in a way. And you see some journals penalizing people that put things on preprint servers, and you see others which encourage it. We're encouraging it because I don't think you can stop the flow of information. That seems kind of crazy. But you can do some kind of version controlling. So you could say a certain version of this paper gets submitted to uh, for review, and then that particular one is the is the version which gets verified. So imagine then, I, I wrote a protocol paper, my you know, perfect unicorn proof of stake paper, and I submit it to a journal, and then I change it, and so one version has passed the review, but I've changed it. So we have to also be careful with with, with things like that. So people also worry about overmetricization, things like journal impact factors, which have turned into these um, kind of uh, I don't know how it is in Germany. I'm not very schooled in, in how things work. In, in Germany, but certainly in the UK and the US, people have gone crazy over metrization of teaching impact factors, local intra, like intra university impact factors, and even these kind of journal page rank index, JIFs, and things like that. And they seem kind of yeah, crazy. Some people have very different opinions about peer review. Some people say peer review is the uh, worst system apart from all the others. Like, uh, like uh, people say about uh, democracy being the worst governance system apart from all the others. Other people say that peer review is completely broken. It doesn't scale. You have all these human bias issues. It's not um, uh, career compatible with um, different, uh, different fields are not um, career compatible in terms of their review processes, in terms of the incentives to engage in interdisciplinary research and, and so on. Uh, open access APCs, predatory journals, we had a little comment about that earlier. So some people look at open access and think that this is like a way that you can kind of engage in unethical or scammy behavior. I guess some of you, let's have a straw poll if you don't mind. Hands up if you've received an unsolicited email or a message on a platform or, 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 or directly to you asking if you'd like a piece of work that's on archive or research gate, if you'd like a book to be published that you've put online. Has anyone received those emails? Okay, quite, quite a few, double figures, all right. Yeah, I also received one of those recently. And at first I fell for it, I was like, oh, that must be how oh, I'm a great author. And then I looked, at, I looked up the company, actually I think they're German, I can't remember the, the name, but I'll have to look it up. And uh, yeah, then I surely found out that, sure, they, they will print the thing for you, but they'll make you buy a bunch of the first copies. And uh, you know, this is kind of like a bonding curve, right? You buy the first few copies, it's super expensive. And then you know, other people get the, the, right, the benefits of the economies of scale. So there's all kinds of weird, uh, shady models going on at the moment. Rights transfer, we had a comment about that already, which is great. So um, I've not got much time to talk about it at the end of the talk, but one of the things we're really um, keen on, and this is something I'm pushing for, is like we're, we're dealing in the business of open source research, like cryptocurrencies and blockchain stuff. It's inherently at its very root. This is you know um, uh, a technology which doesn't require these borders of, of intellectual property and, and so on. And so what we've um, persuaded the MIT Press to do, and they also have like a they're a non-profit, mission-driven scholarly publishers. So they're not really that you know that have predatory tendencies, but we've asked them to take non-exclusive licenses to authors' work so the authors retain rights, because uh, otherwise, um, then the power is centralizing back to us and uh, influence, and we don't want that. Okay, publisher oligopoly, I think um, we probably all know what, what that means. You know, we've got like uh, Nature down the road and Springer and Elsevier, so yes. Um, and those are the things, the, the ones in blue are the things that we're attempting to address with uh, crypto economic systems. So uh, we recently had a conference over in uh, Boston a few weeks ago. Some people in the room uh, made the long journey over there, so we're very grateful for that. And so uh, Zonka asked me to give a very brief wrap-up. So we had about 225 attendees. 
um, 60 or so speakers. This is people from uh, law and regulation and policy and cryptography and distributed systems and complexity. Um, quite, quite a range of people. People from like the real Bitcoin world, people from the BFT protocols, Bitcoin boils the oceans world. So trying to get all these people together and build a big tent and have them um, um, pick at each other essentially in a, in a, in a scholarly sense, I suppose. Um, and so uh, we tried to bring practitioners and academics together. We tried to um, kind of squash people together that, that may not um, uh, share the same venue or, or, or have, have these conversations. So that's what we tried to do. There's a little um, sample of uh, some of the people that, that spoke. And there's plenty of information, all the videos on the Digital Currency Initiative YouTube channel, if you would like to watch those. 61 videos, I believe. Um, and yes, oh, an advert. Um, yes, for our journal. So is Diamond at Open Access. That was a point that came up earlier. And so uh, you have these different kind of variegations or different tiers of how open open access is, which to me is a bit of a cop out. Like uh, it, if it should, for me, open access should map fairly closely onto open source or you know, the most open Creative Commons licenses. Um, and so uh, Diamond Open Access, or AKA Platinum Open Access, re basically represents, there's no paywalls, we're not charging people to read the articles, and there's no APCs, we're not charging authors to, to submit articles. So we're bearing those costs. And more on that later, as uh, we enter a fundraising drive. So, uh, some stuff about the, the journal. So we've got uh, two editors in chief, uh, Neha Narula, who's the director of the Digital Currency Initiative, and Andrew Miller. Uh, who's well known for his work in, in, in practice across uh, all, all kinds of projects and networks. And he's an assistant professor at University of Illinois in Urbana-Champaign. We have um, an advisory board. Now, a lot of these names are probably quite familiar to you, like uh, Shafiq Alwasa with the Turing Medal for Zero Knowledge Proofs, Dan Bonet, who does all the crypto stuff. Dalio Malki is the lead researcher at Calibra, uh, computer scientist at Princeton, economist at Chicago Booth, and, and so on. And the reason we've got this perhaps slightly archaic looking structure to the journal is we're trying to make this thing interoperable and backwards compatible with both the existing silo disciplines and the traditional academic structure. We need this thing to be perceived as credible and legible in order to help us get this thing off the ground and get it going. That's the idea. And then we will slowly shift people outside of their comfort zones. So that's the, that's the idea here. So um, let's talk about interdisciplinarity. This is a great uh, image from a bioinformatics lab at Harvard, like a really nice one. I want somebody to make something like this for me. So if you're cool at, uh, uh, if you're good at, dr at drawing and you want a project, come and, come and see me. So this is something that um, we're worried about. We're worried about the, the gravity well of being an MIT project. So I work you know, with the MIT Digital Currency Initiative. My, um, one of the uh, editors in chief is from MIT. The majority of the editorial board is outside. One of the other editorial editor in chief is outside. The majority of the review committee is outside. So we're trying to build a piece of scholarly infrastructure for the commons. We're trying not to make this like a, you know, all singing, all dancing get MIT show. Um, so this is meant to be an inclusive uh, uh, project initiative. So if you have any questions or queries or comments, um, or you want to point cool stuff up and out that's going on that I might not be aware of, please uh, reach out. Okay. So interdisciplinary challenges. And this is, um, this is a tough one. It's, a it's tough to kind of, especially in academia, where everything is very, it's been structured in a very similar way for a very long time. You have a school of economics, you have a law school, you have a, a computer science faculty, and, and so on. And so these, these structures are, are, you can kind of think of them as ladders, ladders for career progression. And so professors and academics will be climbing the ladder in their particular tower. And that's where the incentives are aligned. They're aligned for them to kind of climb linearly and not so much later, laterally uh, with this kind of interdisciplinary work. So we have to find ways that we can make this thing incentive compatible with, with, with academics. Otherwise, you run the risk that the only people that can really engage in this kind of risky disciplinary research at universities are the people that already have tenure, they already have their job stability, or they already have their permanent positions, as you might call them in, in, in Europe. So that's, that's one thing. And the other thing is that um, uh, the publication traditions vary really a lot. So um, in law, the raw reviews are run by students. In economics, if you want to be an econ professor in a top university, especially in the States, you need to publish in one of the monolithic half dozen journals, which takes years to, to get into. And in computer science, more people run through the conference uh, publication with proceedings uh, pathway because it's faster and it reflects a faster moving field. So there's all these kinds of different things that we have to, to join up. And we also have the tension between expert culture and what I like to think of as epistemic trespassing, which, you know, like Zago and I are particularly guilty of this. Um, and so we're jumping between fields, but those things aren't necessarily um, 
uh, coherent with this uh, linear academic uh, career structure. So um, peer review. Peer review is also hard to do in an interdisciplinary way. So imagine a paper that falls between two disciplines. You would need people that are knowledgeable in those fields and ideally people with some overlap to also be able to, to, to disentangle and, and contextualize that work. Um, yes, pr practice and theory interact in different ways across different fields. So one of the big things about cryptocurrency is most of the key work, the foundational work, was just dropped by anonymous people on random PDF servers. So that's um, very much the upside down and backwards to the way that uh, the, the academy does things. And so how do we integrate all of these different things together? And uh, one of the ways we'd like to do that is by using an open peer review model. And so this is something that was touched on a little bit earlier. So rather than the reviews getting done and then being used to assess whether something is published or not, and then those reviews are basically consigned to the dustbin of history and never, never seen, we'd like to treat the reviewer attention as a scarce and valuable resource. And the, the people, the subject specialists that are disentangling this work, um, the, we can use the artifacts created from the review process and publish those alongside the, um, the work itself. So that's what we're, we're intending to do. So please um, uh, hit me up if you have any ideas about, uh, about that. And we want to encourage transparency as to research. We want to set higher standards and we want to encourage you know, debate about these things, which I think is a little bit missing at the moment. So we have this idea, which I'll, I'll skip through the rest to just to focus on this nice idea that we've got of peer-to-peer -peer review. So the idea being that um, we, can also, we can also go out looking for papers to review. So like we said, like Nakamoto 2008, nobody peer reviewed that. There's errors in the maths of the, of the um, time distribution of blocks for mining. Um, and that was found by mathematicians much later. And you could argue that some of these uh, other discrepancies or, or interesting uh, edge cases might be better observed if they went through a kind of a human verification process. So, um, yes, Jason Potts was touched on earlier. He has this interesting work with Eleanor, uh, Eleanor Rennie from a few years ago about uh, economic models of uh, journals as clubs, where you can think of these as you know, mapping onto guilds and uh, being uh, rivalrous in some sense, but the goods being unbounded. Um, I want to show you very briefly, this is a PetriNet uh, flow model of a decentralized technology uh, token journal, which uh, uh, Toich and uh, State Box guys and uh, Andrew Lewis Pye are working on. I don't have much time, so I will just skip through these, uh, these bits that I stole from them. Academia and practice, I think we said some of this, there's huge structural problems in universities at the moment. Anybody that uh, watches the news or, 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 or uh, is involved in working in universities or research will, will be aware of that. Um, and I think we should, yes, so this is a point, um, you made a point earlier about 60s and 70s and, and, and academics complaining. This is from 7th century BC, academics complaining about doing academic service. Yeah, so yeah, it's an ongoing problem. Um, so yes, open access, I think we've basically covered this. We just have to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of being perceived as predatory or, or, or fake or unethical journals. And that is pretty much it. Here's some questions, help me answer them. Thanks very much. Coming from a sort of institution like MIT and you showed a bunch of people and there's even with the interdisciplinary focus there's a, there's a question of whether the sort of core editors and reviewers are going to bring a lot of disciplinary bias and so you know how in this particular journal does the team sort of combat or at least recognize their mm -hmm. own sort of biases coming from their own fields. Yeah, this is, this is tough because, um, you know, in some ways we have bias, some biases that we do acknowledge in ourselves and some that we don't. Um, kind of known, known unknowns and unknown unknowns, I suppose you could say. Um, so one of the things we're trying to do is, is by, you know, setting up these events, bringing people together and briefing the review committees by constructing them very carefully, we're trying to build the kind of notion and the um, priority of interdisciplinarity into the review process. So we're going to be sending out instructions for the reviewers quite soon, where we're trying to frame, frame this. And, and one of the things you can think about, imagine a paper that falls between uh, cryptography and economics, um, that you may find a very limited set of people that are able to, to, to sufficiently overlap on those two disciplines. But you may be able to find people that can, that can um, uh, stitch together the tapestry independently. That may require a bit more like assistance from the editorial team in terms of producing this like um, review summary. So I think that's something that we've got to, we've got to bear in mind. Good question. So I have a question about open peer review. Mm -hmm. So I have worked in my career for for-profit companies and I have had published 
papers published as researcher. And I've had papers specifically rejected because I worked for a for-profit company. Hmm. So explain to me how a more open peer review would help me. That is a good question. Um, so the, I mean, were these papers that you submitted, were they double-blinded or were they not double-blinded? No, 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 they were not double-blinded. Uh, and I think that yes. was the challenge was yeah. that the reviewers said, this research is fine, it's good, yeah. it's well-written. But because exactly, of where but you came from. We're so, afraid yeah. that this person's really just going to come into a marketing presentation because they work for X company. Oh, so it's about presentation, about a paper for a submission, then a presentation, or? Yeah. Right, okay. So, I mean, the first thing is blinding. So, it's something I didn't really touch on, but we're, we're doing a double or triple blinding, depending how you define that, where the um, identity of the author is not known to the reviewer and the identity of various reviewers are not known to each other until like a certain stage. So that would minimize this, like you could call that a conflict of interest situation. And by the way, this is one of the perceived potential conflict. Of but this is one of the areas that, yeah, we're working on the COI thing right now. I don't know if I, yes, it's, it's right up there. Um, we're working on this conflict of interest situation now because it's even harder with um, cryptocurrencies and so on because the incentives are that much magnified. So it's they, these are not easy answer, questions to answer, um, but there is a bias towards academics looking at industry and thinking it's going to devolve into a sales presentation. So I would say if you're looking for um, you know, a, good, a good example of how not to do that, look at what Zagam does, because he puts the research front and center. So he's really talking about that rather than like wider implications or, or um, how it, in, how, how it uh, uh, breaks down as a business process. Great, thank you. Thanks.